I said I was going to just keep my Verizon router and not deal with another PFSense router, but in the end, I decided to make one. So I've built this system. It's a pretty bare bones system. It's one of the cheapest CPUs available, and it's also one of the lowest wattage ones for the Intel platform. I was looking at the Ryzen platform, like a Ryzen 3. Although the CPU was good, the problem was I, I wasn't able to find any motherboards that I really liked that had dual Intel Ethernet, that sort of thing. At least not at the price point I was looking for. So I ended up with this ASRock Z370M ITX AC. There's a gaming version of this. I don't know. I didn't really look into it, but I don't need a gaming thing. I don't even need the, the Z370 platform. It supports overclocking and all sorts of stuff. Don't need it. This board just happened to be a mini ITX board that had dual gigabit ethernet from intel it also has wi-fi but you can't use that under FreeBSD anyway so it's not really a big deal i also picked up uh, my go-to cooler which is the noctua nhl 9i which is just a small 65 watt tdp cooler and i love this thing they're great they're quiet i mean they'll not, they won't hold up to any overclocking or anything but they do work really well for their size and I was originally going to use my case, which made an appearance way, way back in a video where I did a quick review on the case. Uh, it was a WinSys case. And I actually built the system inside it and then determined that the power supply just made way too much noise. Because in my original router build using that case, I didn't use the power supply. Uh, the board I had simply accepted a barrel jack this board needs a proper power supply, an ATX power supply. The one I was using, which came with it, was a TFX power supply. TFX power supplies are like really tiny, uh, compact power supplies. They're usually used by like OEMs for like small form factor PCs and stuff like that. It just made a ton of noise and I was gonna spend like $20 replacing the fan in it and then what have a cheap power supply because the power supply was crap i mean it had real cheap capacitors in it and everything so in the end i'm just like well i might as well upgrade to a proper power supply and it turns out no one no, there aren't many tfx power supplies that i'd be interested in so how about a case that can accept an atx power supply but still is reasonably small i did a bunch more searching and i eventually settled on this rygen tech rygen tech <laughs> case it's for it's the metis plus metis plus whatever i don't i don't understand these names i don't care it seemed like a decent case this case has a standard atx power supply it's vertically mounted here at the front there's room for a 120 millimeter exhaust fan on the top there's also a 120 millimeter fan at the back and it's a very compact case. It's made out of aluminum with, I think, some steel and a bit of plastic. This is a, an acrylic window, which obviously you don't need. It seems to be a, like a decently priced, just good case for something that's like pretty small. And I wanted something that used 120 millimeter fans so I would keep it relatively quiet. Smaller fans generally you make more noise because they have to spin faster. I ended up replacing the horrible LED fan that was on the back of this thing with uh, just a knock to a, one of the new ones. And I've also switched it around so that it's an intake. In the original configuration, they ship these things with this fan being an exhaust. The fan in the power supply is pulling this way down, so it's an exhaust. And then you have this thing pulling out too. So what, what's happening is all the air is coming in through the top and it's functioning as, a, as like the intake for the CPU and everything. In practice, what happens is it just starves the cooler for air. So you end up with a rather hot CPU. Let me move this light again. I'm trying to get a little bit of fill light on this. And oh, cat fur, cat fur, acrylic. It's so staticky. The trick is to just swap this fan around and then it blows air right in a continuous feed from one side to another. It seems to work really well. I could add another fan up top, but I really don't think I need one. This motherboard actually has very nice configuration of fans. Like it does an auto test to figure out how low an RPM the fan can spin at. And you can set real precise fan curves, tell it exactly what each fan should monitor. For example, 
the CPU fan is tied to the CPU temperature. The case fan is tied to the PCH temperature. So if the motherboard gets hot, it'll run faster. And it just, it's a really nice board. I mean, it is the first time I've used an Intel uh, eighth generation. The CPU in this is an i3 8300T. The T is a lower power version of it. The stand, there's an 8100, which pulls 65 watts. And then you have an 8100T, which is only 35 watts. But the clock speed's quite a bit slower, so it's only a few bucks difference. So I went up to the 8300T, might as well. It was just an OEM part. They're very new. They just came out at the beginning of the month. I don't even know if they sell real retail versions of the T series. It's possible they just don't because they're kind of specialty parts. But either way, I just picked it up on Newegg. So around back, I just used the included Noctua rubbery mounts. I don't really like this. They don't really stay through this thick case along with the filter I've put on. This is actually a magnetic, very fine mesh filter. It just won't stick to the aluminum, obviously, so you're kind of stuck with mounting it some other way. I think I'm gonna replace these with screws and just screw through the, the chassis and the, the grill, or the, the filter. But uh, yeah, these are good mounts. They're just kind of overstretched in this design, so they're kind of all wonky. Anyway, the motherboard has PS2, which we'll never use, some USB 2, bunch of USB 3, audio, which I've disabled in the BIOS, Wi-Fi, which we'll never use, couple HDMI ports, a uh, display port, and two gigabit ethernet ports from Intel, which is the only things, they're the only things we're gonna be using. The case does actually support a card, a dual slot card. So if I ever had to add a 10 gig ethernet card, cause right now I have my PC and my Hackintosh running into a dual port card on the server. And I would like to have it all part of the same network, bridge the two, the 10 gig and the one gigabit ethernet networks together. Cause right now I have two connections, like I can connect through one IP address through one gigabit and one IP address through 10 gigabit. So I'd like to be able to have it all on one network. And I just haven't found the right um, switch. If I find a good switch that has lots of uh, 10 gigabit fiber ports on it, I might get it. And I want one without a fan though. And they're hard to find. And, or the other option is to get a 10 gigabit card and run everything into the server and link the networks together, which is probably something I'll do in the future. Anyway, uh, the, since the case does support some cards, you have options, you can put in more gigabit ones too. If you have some kind of bridging setup or anything like that, the case has a simple panel, a little cover that you can release and then install all your cards. And the case is it's nice, it's, it's cheap and it's very cramped inside. But I do actually like this case. It, it, it has a very nice clean look. If we spin around to the front, the front has next to nothing on it. It looks gigantic in this shot, but it's actually, it's actually not that big. This is the box that my RAM came in for comparison. So it's not huge. The memory I'm using, as you can see, is just some cheap Patriot uh, 2400 DDR4, it's a eight gig kit. So it can run in dual channel mode. Eight gigs is plenty for a PFSense router unless you're doing really fancy stuff. I can always upgrade that later because I'm sure by the time I upgrade the RAM in this, I will have a, another motherboard on my main computer which will take the DDR4 and I can just put these in there. <laughs> this is actually the most advanced computer I have in terms of generations. My PC is a fourth gen Intel and my Hackintosh is a third gen Intel core series. In Cinebench, this thing's actually kind of close to my uh, 4790K, which uh, currently isn't overclocked though. But considering this is a bottom end low power CPU and mine is a top of the line hyper threaded CPU that can be overclocked, it's kind of funny how this thing is like, 50 or 60% of its speed. So it's actually really impressive that a really cheap CPU these days is so fast. Looking in from the top, you can just unscrew the top and put in another fan, a couple USB 3 ports and audio. Uh, these are good for flash drives, but that's about it. Inside we can see the rather cramped wiring job you have to do when you have an ATX power supply. Part of the reason is that an ATX power supply uses a full 
length cable for everything. Even when, the mo when you're using a modular one, the cables are still long. So there's not much room to actually jam the cables. Luckily up here, you don't need any airflow. So just jamming everything up here keeps the main airflow area cl relatively clear. And that's okay. You know, it, it doesn't look pretty, but you know, whatever. It's going to be a router against a wall anyway. It, I didn't even need the window. It just happened to come with a window. I'm using this hideous red serial ATA cable because I need a straight through cable because the solid state drive, which you can't see, is actually tucked way into the upper portion of the case. And you need the um, a straight in connector or else it'll foul with the, the chassis. So I just have a, it's actually an, um, an M SATA card, a 32 gig, I think it's a crucial one. I, I had it in my old router, but it's just a really teeny tiny SSD, but I've actually put it into a serial ATA uh, module, like it just sits inside. It looks like a two and a half inch drive now, basically. And uh, yeah, I'm just using that. I don't, this has an M.2 slot, but I don't have an M.2 SSD, so. There's no point in buying a new one. It's not like it needs that speed or anything. As you can see on the motherboard, there's a few serial ATA ports. I think it has six, and two of them are off in the middle of nowhere, which seems kind of weird. They're on the other side of the memory, but you know, it works. It gave me a little more wiggle room. And the power supply in here, uh, again, this is one of the main reasons why I switched to a bigger case is because I can use a real quality power supply. This is a Seasonic Focus Gold. It's the 550 watt version, I think, which is insane overkill for this board. This board, when idle, uses 20 watts. When it's under full load, and I mean like I'm running ADA64 with disk test, CPU test, GPU to everything running, all just stressing it, the most I was able to get this thing to pull was 65 watts. That's absolute worst case impossible scenario. So in a perfect world, the power supply would be like 100 watts. I can't get one that small. Seasonic makes a 430 watt version in this series. I don't think it's modular. And I think it was around $65 at the time of purchase. For actually a bit less, I managed to get this fully modular, more powerful 550 watt power supply because there was a rebate on it. So instead of $64, this one, even though it's more powerful and modular, only costs 50 because there's a $25 rebate. So I, I doubt the rebate's gonna be going much longer. I think it only had a few days left when I purchased. So these things come on sale, you just keep an eye out for one. But for, six, for about 50 bucks, a really high quality Seasonic power supply, can't complain. If you want to make a, a build, like an actual proper build in this thing where you're, um, building a, like a gaming PC or something, I would suggest getting an SFX power supply. SFX power supplies are compatible with ATX power supplies. They're just shrunk down. You can get a small bracket for, you know, 10 bucks or something that will let you mount it in this, you know, just search SFX to ATX adapter. You'll find it and it'll give you a lot more room and you can get like 650 watt SFX power supply. So if you want to run a gaming system on this thing, you can. As for a low power system, it, it really doesn't matter. You, you know, you're, I don't care if all the cables are jammed up in there. You don't need really good airflow or, except for around here. Like I was saying before, it would, it's way overkill to have a more powerful power supply. They're generally way less efficient as you drop in their total load. So if this is 500 watts and it's using 20, it's gonna be way less efficient than per watt than if it was running at 300 watts. So when they're really under run, they really don't work as well. You really wanna aim for like the sweet spot. So like your average load should be about 50% of its load. They just don't make that low wattage power supplies. Another option is a Pico power supply, which is essentially a small DC to DC converter on a, on a ATX power supply. And what that does is it takes a DC jack in, provides 12 volts, and then it just creates uh, the other voltage rails, which aren't as heavily used. Now you can get them in like the 100 watt range. You know, a quality one is like 65 bucks anyway, and 
I don't know how good these power adapters are, and a lot of them you can't open them without breaking them, like breaking the plastic around it, and then you break the plastic around it and it turns out to be crap. So what, you're gonna buy a new one, or you can't return it. So you're gonna buy another power supply in addition to the one you just bought. Whatever, just get a damn ATX power supply. I know it's gonna be inefficient. It's very quiet, you can even turn off the fan. There's a switch underneath it and it will shut the fan off, but I just don't like the thought of that. I like having a fan on in my power supply, even if it's really low. This is a very quiet fan. That's the basic build. It's really just a motherboard, a couple, a couple fans and a, an SSD but it should last me quite some time. One concern I had when I was purchasing this was that this board does not support the T-Series CPUs out of the box. It supports the non-T-Series 8300 and whatnot, but it doesn't support the T-Series because they're brand new. They don't have like the micro code or whatever in the, in the BIOS. In the version history for the BIOS of this board, version two adds support for these CPUs. As soon as I picked up the, the CPU, now you probably can't see it unless you're watching in 4K, but there's a sticker on the BIOS that says version 1.6. So when I got the board, I went, oh great, it's not gonna work with the CPU. And I was thinking, well, it's gonna be the same situation as the Supermicro Opteron build that I did oh so long ago where the CPU can't be detected, so you need an older CPU to flash it to the, the new BIOS, and then you can just switch to the, the newer CPU. Luckily, you put the, I, like, you know, you just pop in the T-Series chip and it worked. It, it recognized it completely. I was able to update the BIOS to version two. No problem whatsoever. So in this particular case, on this particular motherboard, it actually works just fine. And it, it was great. I didn't have to uh, acquire another chip. You know, you can either, um, buy one, buy an older series chip and sell it on eBay. Once you've used it, you can do the unethical thing, which is to buy one on Amazon and then just send it back. <laughs> but that's a little, a little dodgy there. Or you could just try and track down a used chip on eBay and then resell it. There you have it. Very simple video for a very simple build. Nothing too fancy here. I just wanted to kind of talk about the specifics of the hardware I was able to track down for this build.